Hello, beautiful souls. My name is Abnormally Carolyn. Thank you for clicking on this video. This channel is all about true crime, conspiracy theories, and anything abnormal. If you are a returning subscriber, thank you so, so much. If you're new, I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. The 1970s were a notorious time for serial killers in Los Angeles area. One of the most vile and disgusting killings were done by Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. They were known as the toolbox killers, not to be confused with the toy box killer. These two were known as the toolbox killers. Lawrence Bittaker had had trouble with the law since he was 12 years old. By the time he was 18, Lawrence Bittaker was sentenced to the California Youth Authority for shoplifting, petty theft, auto theft, hit and run, and evading arrest. If you've watched other true crime videos about different killers in the 70s in California, you've probably heard of the California Youth Authority because apparently they were all there. <laughs> When he was released, he had found out that his adoptive parents had disowned him and wanted nothing further to do with him. Adoptive parents had moved to another state and he had no way to contact them. Within days of being released, Lawrence was in trouble with the law again. He was charged with auto theft and driving a stolen car across state lines. In August 1959, he was sentenced to 10 months in an Oklahoma prison, then transferred to Springfield, Missouri, that released him the following year. Lawrence developed a pattern of getting in trouble with the law, being sent to prison, getting released, committing more crimes, getting caught again, sent back to prison, get out of prison, committing more crimes, getting sent back to prison. Over the next 14 years, he was arrested at least six times, all for offenses ranging from parole violation, theft, leaving the scene of an accident or burglary. During his incarceration, he was put through several psychological tests in which he was diagnosed as being borderline psychotic a highly manipulative character and had considerable concealed hostility towards authority. He was found to have quite a high IQ of 138. Further examination showed he was resistant to acknowledging his responsibility in any type of crime he committed. Lawrence confided in his psychiatrist that his criminal activities gave him a sense of power and a sense of self-importance. He was prescribed antipsychotic medication, and I'll give you one guess as to whether or not he continued taking that medication. If you guess no, ding, 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 you're the winner. Finally, in 1974, Lawrence was caught stealing a steak from a grocery store and he was caught by one of the store clerks who followed him out of the store. He ended up stabbing that employee who approached him. He was subdued by other employees at the grocery store and was apprehended. The store clerk did survive his injuries and Lawrence was charged with assault with a deadly weapon and sent to California Men's Colony in St. Louis Obispo. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the other side of this duel, Roy Norris. Roy Norris spent part of his childhood living with his birth parents, but he was shuffled around in between family members and anyone who would take, anyone the parents could find to take care of him. He just kind of was shuffled around to relatives or friends or anyone who was willing to take care of him. His parents were really not interested in having him. 
At one point in Colorado, he was living with a foster family and he was essayed by the foster parents. When he was 16, he made sexual references to a female relative. When he was punished for this, he stole his father's car, headed to the Rocky Mountains and attempted to unalive himself by injecting air into an artery. He was caught by police and returned home to his parents. When he returned home, his parents told him they were divorcing and that they had never wanted to be together and they were only together because of him and his sister. Oh, and his parents did point out that they had never wanted him or his sister, which I'm sure that's not damaging at all. At 17, Norris dropped out of high school and joined the US Navy. At 21, he was sent to Vietnam. While there, he learned to become an electrician and developed a dependency on a little bit of the devil's lettuce and heroin. In November, 1969, Roy Norris was arrested for essay and attempted essay as he tried to kidnap and force a woman into her car. And as we often hear in these lovely stories, he did not spend much time in jail. Three months later, yes, he was caught and convicted of essaying a woman. And three months later, he was released from prison. And guess what he went on to do? He was caught breaking into another woman's home. Fortunately, on this occasion, he was caught. So the woman, whoever she was, did not end up being assaulted. In May 1970, on the San Diego State University campus, Norris stopped a female student, attacked her, and struck her in the head with a rock. He, he pounded her head into the sidewalk while he kneed her in the back. Charged with assault and sentenced to five years at a state hospital, he was diagnosed as a mentally disordered SA offender. And after five years, authorities determined that he was no longer a threat to the public and he was released. It only took three months for him to get back to his own ways and he essayed a woman in Redondo Beach, California. Norris was sentenced to California Men's Colony in St. Louis Obispo and this is where he met Lawrence Bittaker. While in prison, Lawrence had saved Norris from attacks by other inmates a few times and they had become very close friends. As they grew closer, they realized they both had very similar interests. And they weren't interested in hiking, playing chess. No, what they were interested was essaying women. The two discussed how they loved the sight of a frightened woman. Lawrence, until this point, had not committed any sexual offenses, but expressed a deep interest in starting to do that. And Lawrence explained when he did start to commit these crimes, he would not leave any living witnesses. During their time behind bars, the two men just became closer and closer, as did their plots for perversion. The two discussed their fantasies of kidnapping, essaying, and killing a woman for every age between the ages of 13 and 19. So the two continued to develop this plan of how, when they were released, they would commit these crimes together. Lawrence was released first in October, 1978. He was a skilled 
machinist and earned $4,000 a month. And this was in the 1970s, so that was quite a bit of money. Especially it was quite a bit of money for a convicted felon to be making straight out of prison. Lawrence lived at a Burbank motel and was very popular with local teenagers, as they always seem to be. He was well known to always have beer and the devil's lettuce available for any of these teens that wanted some. Norris was released three months later in January and moved in with his mother in Redondo Beach. He started working as an electrician in Compton and it wasn't long before he got a letter from Lawrence. They met in February and started developing their plan. The first order of business was to purchase a van. If you've ever heard the term serial killer van, it's sometimes believed that these are the two that originated that serial killer van situation. They're the ones that sometimes are believed to have originated or made this sort of popular and mainstream that this is what serial killers would use to abduct victims. The duo purchased a 1977 GMC cargo van in February 1979 with no side windows and a large sliding door, just like the cliche. They would nickname their killing machine Murder Mac. For three months, the duo would cruise up and down the Pacific Coast Highway from Redondo Beach to Santa Monica. And perfect Southern California weather and beach communities meant a lot of young girls out hitchhiking, looking for rides, heading to the beach. They started talking to these young girls. If they'd be in a parking lot near a beach, they'd offer them beer or the devil's lettuce just trying to kind of feel out the situation. And at this time, it was all practice for them. They wanted to get 20 young girls to willingly get into the van with them, party with them, let them take Polaroid pictures of them, and then they would let the girls go. They decided before they would start actually committing the crimes that they wanted practice to see how these girls would react and what things they could do to keep the girls in the van and to get the girls in the van. Once they were confident that they could get victims very easily, they installed a bed in the back of their van murder mac like that's a lame name you can't come up with anything better than murder mac like <sighs> supposedly this guy had an iq of 138 and the best name you can come up with for the van is murder mac but i'm totally off topic i get obsessed with little things you will notice but i will move on <laughs> After they installed the bed, they also put a number of coolers in the van that they would fill up with ice, with beer and soda, trying to lure the girls. They also put together a toolkit that they would use to torture these young girls. And this is how they got the name, the Toolbox Killers. And can we just stop making up lame names for serial killers? Because I feel like they really like it. Like they seem to love the names that the media comes up with for them. And I don't know why it's necessary to come up with these stupid names. But who the hell am I? I'm just a girl on YouTube talking about true crime. So I guess they'll just keep making weird, messed up crazy names for serial killers. They also would have extra clothing in the van so that after they had committed their crimes, 
they could change out of blood soaked clothing into clean clothing for an easier escape. Next, they searched for a location, somewhere secure, somewhere private. Just beyond the St. Gabriel Mountains, they found an old fire road. They broke the lock at the gate and replaced it with their own. And it was go time and they were on the hunt. They had prepared everything they wanted prepared and they were ready to start committing these crimes. On June 24th, 1979, Cindy Schaefer was just 16 years old when her grandmother dropped her off at St. Andrew's Church in Redondo Beach for a fellowship meeting. Cindy only stayed at the meeting for about 20 minutes and then decided to start walking home. On her walk home, Lawrence and Norris tried to offer her a ride. She said no. They tried to offer her beer, the devil's lettuce, and she was not interested. She was probably a very intelligent girl that was like, you guys are two freaking weirdos. I'm not getting in your van. And she just kept walking. Unfortunately, they pulled up ahead of her and parked. Norris opened the sliding door to the van and pretended that he was doing something or fixing something or getting something out of the van. Well, she walked by. Norris grabbed her and threw her in the van. Lawrence cranked the stereo to full volume while Norris tied her up and they obviously cranked the radio to muffle her screams. This became their modus operandi for acquiring victims. This is a pattern they would repeat over and over and over. Lawrence drove the van to the St. Gabriel Mountains to the secret location that they had pre-planned. Once there, Norris told Lawrence he wanted some time alone with Cindy. Lawrence agreed and wandered off into the mountains to give them some privacy. And Norris essayed Cindy. The two of them took turns throughout the night essaying her and torturing her. Cindy asked them if they were going to kill her and they told her no. And Cindy asked them if they were going to kill her, would they allow her time to pray before she did it? And I can't even imagine this young girl who, I can't even imagine the terror she must have been feeling. And she just wanted time to pray because she knew that she was not gonna make it out of this alive. And this is sickening, but this is what Lawrence later recalled of Cindy. He said, Cindy displayed a magnificent state of self-control and composure, acceptance of the condition of which she had no control. She shed no tears, offered no resistance, and expressed no great concern for her safety. I guess she knew what was coming. And yes, you sick bastard, she knew what was coming. That's why she asked you for time to pray before you killed her. <laughs> Hmm. Like a 16 year old girl, I can't imagine. And this is just the first victim. Hold up, because we got a lot more to go. And it just gets more sick and more twisted. If you're enjoying this video, give it a like, because I upload videos like this all the time. When it came time to kill her, the two argued about who would actually commit the murder. Both wanted the other one to do it. Norris lost and he was chosen to finish the task. Norris tried to strangle her 
with his bare hands, but after 45 seconds became physically disturbed by the look in her eyes and released his grip. He ran in front of the van and threw up his false teeth and all. Lawrence took over. He tried to strangle her as well, but apparently strangling someone was a lot harder than either of them had imagined. Poor things. It was just too hard to strangle her. Mm. Cindy slumped to the ground and began convulsing. They then grabbed a coat hanger from the van and put it around her neck and twisted until she was no longer alive. Lawrence found a steep cliff and the two decided to wrap her in a shower curtain that they had brought with them and threw her lifeless body off. And Lawrence assured Norris that animals would get rid of the evidence this poor young girl's body. Meanwhile, Cindy's grandmother had called the police when Cindy had not returned home, but the police at this point, they had no body, they had no leads. They really didn't have any connect, like they had no tips. They had no connection between her and these fucking horrible men. So it was very difficult at that time because there was no connection between them and no one had witnessed the abduction. And they weren't caught at this time. Just two weeks later on January 8th, 1979, Lawrence and Norris were cruising in the Pacific Coast Highway looking for their next victim. They spotted 18 year old Andrea Hall hitchhiking in Manhattan Beach. They slowed to offer her a ride. Another car slowed at the same time and she got into that car instead. So she almost got away, but the two followed the car that she had gotten into and when she got out of the car, they pulled up to her. The car had dropped her off at Redondo Beach and she was looking to travel farther and they offered her a ride and she accepted. Not knowing what was to come. This time Lawrence was driving, but Norris was hiding in the back, ready to strike. When she got into the van, Lawrence offered her a drink and she accepted. And he said that there were coolers in the back of the van and she could go back there and grab whatever she wanted. Unfortunately, Norris was lying in wait. And when she was in the back of the van, Norris grabbed her. And just like the last time, Lawrence blared the radio to muffle this poor, girls screams but Andrea was a strong girl and she put up a fight she was fighting for her life she was a strong girl and she was not gonna go down easy unfortunately Norris eventually overpowered her subdued her tied her up and they drove to the same private location that they had already set up. Lawrence forced her to walk along the van naked uphill and then perform sexual acts on him against her will and pose for Polaroid pictures. And when I started looking into this case, the Polaroid pictures really pissed me off. It pissed me off that they were gonna have Polaroid pictures of the victims, but those Polaroid pictures actually 
worked in the police's favor in these young girls who had lost their lives. Those Polaroid pictures were gonna make some amazing evidence. Norris drove back to town to get more alcohol and when he re had returned, Lawrence had already killed the young girl. And when he was telling her he was going to kill her, he said to her, give me as many reasons as you can for me not to kill you. And if she gave him enough reasons, she could live. And obviously she was never going to live and he took an ice pick and I try not to say the most kind of gruesome things. YouTube doesn't like it and the gruesome details are a lot sometimes, but they are part of the story. But that wasn't enough to kill her, so he strangled her and threw her off a cliff. Andrea's sister and brother-in-law very quickly reported her missing, but the police had nothing to go on. She wasn't abducted. She willingly got into the car and no one knew anything where she was, what had happened. There was no clues for the police to follow. The two took a two month break and on September 3rd spotted 15 year old Jackie Gilham and 13 year old Leah Lamp sitting on a bus stop bench near Hermosa Beach. The girls had been hitchhiking and Lawrence and Norris offered them a ride to the beach and they accepted. It wasn't long before Leah realized Lawrence was driving away from the beach, not towards it. She knew she was in trouble. Lawrence gave the excuse that they were going to look for a place where they could park and smoke some of the devil's lettuce. Leah didn't buy their story. She was a smart girl. She knew that this was not gonna go well. And she reached for the door, tried to open it and jump out. And unfortunately, Norris had a bag full of BBs and quickly hit her over the head with it and threw her in the back of the van. When a bystander at the public tennis court noticed the altercation, Lawrence told the man that she was having a bad LSD trip and drove off. Lawrence drove them back to their private location and neither man ha seemed to have any interest in Leah. They said that Leah was overweight and so they focused their attention on Jackie. Lawrence took out his cassette recorder because he wanted to record the first time that he ooh, ate, essayed a virgin. He commanded Jackie to act like she was enjoying it. And Norris went one step further when he was R.A. essaying her and act, got her to act as though she was his cousin. <sighs> I just, I can't imagine what is going through these poor girls' minds while these things are happening. That night, Norris and Lawrence took turns standing watch with the, while the others slept next to the girls. In the morning, they took Leah up a hill and told her to strip naked. They then took photos of her in sexual positions, tied her up and left her. Lawrence again turned his focus to Jackie and he shoved an ice pick 
and strangled her just like he had with Andrea. Leah again tried to escape, but before she could, Lawrence struck her in the head with a short-handled sledgehammer, knocking her out. He then strangled her. To make sure she was dead, Norris then beat her in the head. And both girls were reported missing by their families. And like the other girls, there were no bodies and the police had nothing to go on. So these two sick bastards continued. About two months passed and the two men were out on Halloween when Lauren saw a girl he knew. 16 year old Lynette Ledford was standing behind of a gas station. She had left a Halloween party near Los Angeles. She had fought with some boys at the party and was heading home. Lawrence offered her a ride and Lawrence was a regular at the McDonald's she worked at. So she accepted the ride because she thought she was safe. This time Lawrence was very impatient. He didn't want to take the time to drive out to the abandoned road where they had committed all of the other murders. He decided to do this one on the go. He drove down a deserted street. Norris drew a knife. He then bound and gagged her with duct tape. The two men switched places and Norris drove aimlessly around the streets for over an hour. Lawrence, in the back seat with Lynette, carried out his most vicious essay so far. Lawrence turned on a tape recorder and recorded the entire event. He beat her, he essayed her, he forced her to perform sexual acts on him, and he forced her to say that she liked it through her cries and her screams. He then took out a pair of pliers from the toolbox. This toolbox is how they got their name. He took those pliers and mutilated her private areas, her breasts, just the worst things you can imagine someone doing with pliers to a body is what he did. By the time it was Norris's turn, it was no longer possible. He had done so much damage to her with the pliers that the acts that Norris wanted to perform. Her body was not in a condition that they could be performed. He forced her to perform a sexual act on him. Well, he used a sledgehammer beating her elbow repeatedly. He hit her 25 times on the elbow with the sledgehammer, which could be heard in the recordings because they were recording all of this in between her screams. He turned off the tape recorder and Norris killed her in the same way that they had in the previous as I had mentioned, they would use a coat hanger and twist it until the girls would pass away. This time he used pliers to twist and her throat, when he was finished, ended up only being about the size of a quarter, her entire neck was the size of a quarter. 
And Roy Norris was quite proud of these recordings. When he was later talking about them, he would talk about how, you know, you hear women scream in horror movies, but it's nothing like the real thing to him. And he said he doubted that any person could listen to more than 60 seconds of the recording. And believing they were above the law, Lawrence decided he was just gonna dump her at the side of the road. He wasn't gonna try to hide the body. He wanted the body to be found. He wanted to see the reaction of the public and the authorities when they found her body. A jogger found her body the next morning and police obviously came to the scene and started investigating, but it would be three weeks until they would get another clue. And the next month, Roy Norris visited an old friend of his from the California men's colony named Joe Jackson. Norris and Joe Jackson had both discussed while they were in prison, discussed their fantasies of these essayings and what they wanted to do with women. So Norris thought he could tell Joe what he had been doing and that Joe would keep it quiet. But he was wrong because even though Jackson was a convicted felon, he also had two young daughters and the amount of detail and horrific nature of the crimes did not sit well with Joe Jackson. And Jackson contacted his attorney and informed the police of what had been confessed to him and the Hermosa Beach Police Department started investigating. Jackson in for questioning and he described the van and the van that he, that he described was exactly the same as an attempted sexual assault by another young woman that had happened two months prior. The victim of this essay was Robin Roback and she now lived in Oregon. So the police traveled to her to show her photos of both Norris and Lawrence. And within seconds, she picked them both out from the photo lineup. And Roy Norris was put under investigation. He was quickly arrested for selling the devil's lettuce. I, I smoke myself. I always find it weird referring to it as the devil's lettuce, but <laughs> YouTube's so picky about what words you can say. So <laughs> it just, it, I get a little chuckle in my head each time I say it. But he, it was great because they were able to arrest him on parole violations. They had caught him selling the devil's lettuce and got to put him in jail for parole violations. So it worked out quite well for the police at this point. And that is when the police searched his vehicle. And something I had mentioned that was going to come up earlier in the video, I mentioned these Polaroid pictures. Well, these two dumb bastards kept the pictures in their car and the police found them immediately. Now, Norris tried to say that nothing had happened to these girls. They were all well and fine and da 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 whatever. You know, he's lying, trying to cover up his shit, obviously, but the police definitely looked into it further. The same day that the police were still at Norris's home, Lawrence called and, and an officer answered the phone. Pretend to be Nor one of Norris's friends. It didn't work though. Lawrence didn't fall for it. He immediately drove to a cemetery in the Hollywood Hills and buried the torture tapes. He then returned to his hotel in Burbank and was immediately arrested. And Lawrence was surprisingly cooperative when he was arrested. And he handed over several of these Polaroid pictures to the police. And many of the photos were of Andrea Joy Hall and Jackie Gilham. So thanks for that. 
Both men obviously initially claimed to be innocent, but when police found the van, there was just too much evidence to deny it. They found over 500 of these Polaroid pictures of women, two necklaces from the victims, a book on how to find police broadcasting frequencies, a sledgehammer, a jar of Vaseline, a plastic bag full of lead weights, and most damning of all, a tape of the final killing of Lynette Ledford. And unfortunately, the tape was played for Lynette's mother so that she could identify that it was her daughter and it was. And that part was really hard for me to read. I can't imagine someone, your daughter, dying in that manner. And I mean, I'm sure they didn't make her watch, obviously, the whole tape, but I'm sure she would have seen enough that that would have traumatized her. I, I can't even imagine how much that would have traumatized her. And when detectives interrogated Norris, um, he knew that the evidence was mounting and there was just way too much evidence. These guys were never going to get away with this. And Norris quickly took a plea deal and he pled guilty in his role in the killings and agreed to testify against Lawrence. In exchange, he was offered a reduced sentence of life with no parole. So he escaped the death penalty. But Lawrence, however, didn't admit to anything. Not that it really fucking mattered because there was so much goddamn evidence at this point. Like there's no way these guys were going to get away with this. Lawrence was charged with five counts of first degree murder, robbery, kidnapping, forcible essay, sexual perversion, and criminal conspiracy. Norris was charged with the same except one of the first degree murders was reduced to second degree murder charge. Uh, Norris had led investigators to the fire road in the St. Gabriel Mountains. He showed them exactly where each killing took place. During the interrogation, he spoke of the murders in a casual, incoherent manner. Like a mechanic would describe a problem with your car. Upon searching the St. Gabriel Mountains, um, police were able to uh, discover the bodies of Jackie and Leah, but the bodies of Cindy and Andrew, Andrea were never found. Jackie's skull still had an ice pick lodged in it, and Leah's skull showed multiple fractures from the sledgehammer. During the trial, the most damning piece of evidence was the audio tape of the torture of Lynette Ledford. Courtroom attendees were seen running from the courthouse in tears, visibly shaken by the vile recordings. And many of the details, which I think is good, many of the details um, were left out because they were just too gruesome. And from everything that we do know, I, I'm pretty sure that was a good decision. On March 18th, 1980, Roy Norris pled guilty to all four counts of first degree murder, second degree murder for Andrea Joy Hall, and two counts of SA and one count of robbery. May 7th was his sentencing. Roy Norris was sentenced to 45 years to life with parole eligibility in 2010. He decided not to attend the parole hearing in 2010, but in 2019, he showed up wanting parole. And guess what? Denied. On February 17th, 1981, Lawrence was found guilty on all five murder charges and was sentenced to death. Due to California legal changes, Lawrence was never actually put to death and will most likely die of prison, in prison of old age. He currently is in San Quentin prison and 
sometimes responds to letters from the public in which he signs with the nickname Pliers. And if that doesn't make you want to throw up, I don't know what does. So that, you guys, is the absolutely horrific story of the Toolbox Killers. Uh, I really appreciate you guys being here today. It's always hard to end these videos because I'm telling you such horrible stories, but I hope you all have beautiful, amazing days. I thank you so much for being here. And if you enjoyed the video, give it a like, subscribe, share it with a friend. We all know we've got those true crime besties who love a good true crime. So take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. And I will see you in the next one.